Courbet's The Stone Breakers from 1849 perfectly sums up realism as an avant-garde movement. First, its subject matter. It shows us one of the primary aims of realism to represent the classes of people who have been left out of high art. Realism insisted that all classes deserved representation. So here, Courbet has painted the lowest of the lower classes, the most desperately impoverished workers doing the hardest back-breaking labor, hammering stones. Their clothes are torn, tattered, patched. We see the strain in their bodies as they toil for what is obviously just pennies. Realist artists and writers depicted working-class cafes and bars, peasants, workers, prostitutes, laundresses. This includes Courbet and others like Degas, women ironing. All of them valued the low, the commonplace, the socially dispossessed. Two important French novelists the, who are brothers, the Goncourt brothers, realist writers, wrote in 1864 about this turn to these kinds of subjects. They said, living in the 19th century, in a time of universal suffrage, they meant that they were living in a time when historical progress had led to what they called universal suffrage, everyone being able to vote. But of course they were wrong. Women did not actually have the right to vote in France until 1945. Nevertheless, let's go back to what they're saying about realism. Living in a time of universal suffrage, democracy, liberalism, we asked ourselves whether what one calls the lower classes have no right to the novel. We asked ourselves whether there should still exist, be it for writer or reader, in these times of equality, classes too unworthy, sufferings too low, tragedies too foul-mouthed, catastrophes whose terror is not sufficiently noble. We began to wonder whether, in a country without caste or legal aristocracy, the sufferings of the poor and humble could touch our interest, our pity, our emotions, as sharply as the sufferings of the rich and mighty. Courbet's painting, The Stonebreakers, was condemned by the critics. One art critic actually called it seditious. In other words, that critic considered it to be a form of treason against France. Now, what's interesting is the reasoning of this outraged critic, who claimed that the problem was not that Courbet painted peasants, but because, here I'm quoting the critic, he presented them in a way that is contrary to human nature. Nobody could deny that a stonebreaker is as worthy a subject in art as a prince or any other individual. But at least let your stonebreaker not be as insignificant as the stone he is breaking. We can question whether the critic truly believes, quote, a stonebreaker is as worthy a subject as any prince. But putting that aside, let's think about why he found it scandalous that Courbet made the stonebreaker seem as insignificant as the stone he was breaking. Is the critic right? Do these stonebreakers seem as insignificant as the stones they are breaking? Yes, I think so. And Courbet has provoked that feeling deliberately. Look at how much of the canvas is taken up by the ground, the soil, the stones, the earth, the weeds and shrubs, the implements scattered around, the pot, the basket. We use the term low class versus high class. That's a metaphor of low to the ground versus high up and elevated, of up and down. And these figures are clearly at the bottom of the world, kneeling, bending, scarcely above the animals. Courbet gives us the painfully detailed examination of their shoes and clothes, but he obscures their faces. We don't see their eyes. We don't see their expression. We see only their laboring bodies. The individuality and human emotion that is conveyed through a face, that's stripped away, as if this brutal work 
has dehumanized them. So Corbet's painting levels a harsh accusation at the society that uses up people like this. That's why the critic found it seditious. The critic who condemned Corbet's stonebreakers, his realism, would have wanted a picture of peasants to fit the mold of this painting by Corbet's contemporary Bougerou. These are peasants who can reassure French critics of the French bourgeoisie that all is well in their land. No need for revolutions. These children are poor Breton villagers who go around barefoot without shoes, yet their feet are miraculously clean. Their clothing is spotless, tidy, charming, no patches, no holes. Their beautiful faces, also clean, well scrubbed, are soulful and submissive. In other words, Bougerou's painting is a sentimental fiction, a lie. So this brings us to another point. Realism in art and literature as an avant-garde movement was not just about subject matter. It was about a commitment to truth. Another critic from Corbet's moment said that uh, Corbet no one could drag art into the gutter with greater technical virtuosity. A kind of a backhanded compliment. Yes, you can paint with great virtuosity, but you're dragging art into the gutter. Corbet's painting is an engine of revolution. The gutter, the lowest place where all the dirt and the dregs of society flows. This is why it's an engine of revolution. So his painting is a threat. That's what these critics are saying. It is a threat because he is telling the truth about life as it is lived in a class divided society. So you didn't become a realist in the avant-garde sense simply by depicting a peasant. It was bigger than that. You were a realist if you were committed to telling the truth, the brutal truth, the uncomfortable truth. So we can understand the implications of this from this quote by the great 19th century philosopher George Luce, who was married to, well, he wasn't married to George Eliot. She and he had a, a serious relationship, but he couldn't get a divorce at the time. So they, but they were life partners. So she was a great British realist novelist. And he's explaining what realism is about. Realism, he says, is the basis of all art. Listen to what he's saying. He says, realism is not just this avant-garde movement, but it's really the true basis of what art should be. Its antithesis is not idealism, but falsism. So this, this antithesis of the real and the ideal is often used to contrast Corbet's stonebreakers with Bougerou's peasants. That this is a kind of an idealization, this is realist, but he's saying really what's at stake is that this is false. The opposite of realism is falsism. When our painters represent peasants with regular features and irreproachable linen, right? Not, not even a, a little tiny little stain on her white sleeve. And yet she's, you know, this 10 year old peasant girl in the fields. I can't even keep a white shirt clean when I'm drinking a cup of coffee. When their milkmaids have the air of keepsake beauties whose costume is picturesque. So we don't see her as getting up at four in the morning to milk the cows and getting and getting dirty and tired and sweaty. No, she looks like a keepsake beauty. She looks like she could be a little doll. Never old or dirty. Notice that Corbet shows us one of the stonebreakers is an older man, potentially right in his 50s, 60s, still kneeling on the ground. Imagine how much his joints hurt that he has to stuff this grass under his knee to cushion it. When Hodge, a character from a novel, is so when Hodge, a peasant character in a novel, is made to speak refined statements in unexceptionable English, and children utter long speeches of religious and poetic enthusiasm. So he's talking about novelists here rather than artists who would put in the mouths of 
desperately poor people, these sort of refined, elegant remarks full of poetry, when in fact they didn't speak like that. An attempt is made to idealize, but the result is simply falsification. He says that this is this kind of art is mythologizing, lying. It's giving us a fantasy view of the world that we cannot sustain. We have to be in touch with reality. So he ends with this rousing statement. Either give us true peasants, there should not be an apostrophe there, oops, or leave them untouched. Either paint no drapery at all or paint it with utmost fidelity. Either keep your people silent or make them speak the idiom of their class.